All right, today in Beers TV, our top fails are actually plumbing. Uh, we have like 30 of them almost, yeah. uh, to be honest. I think we could have episode two and three because there's so many ways to screw this up. Yep. I've done them all. Uh, <laughs> so we can share with you all of our fails so you don't actually have to experience them yourself. Okay, so starting with number one. Yeah, this one is uh, missing the value of soft plumbing. So uh, this is what I plumb my first tank with. And I have to tell you, it is super easy. And uh, it helps to avoid, you know, some, I'm not an expert plumber. I can do, uh, you know, hard plumbing, uh, but getting, you know, the right measurements and cuts and angles and things like that, right? One, I have a hard time with the patience to do that unless I really focus on taking my time. Soft plumbing is like kind of my way around that. Yeah, actually we did a really nice job of soft plumbing on the Reef Savvy tank that was in my office a while back. Mm. It's just way, way easier. It's way easier to get the lengths cut, uh, way more like newbie friendly yeah, right? and way less expensive, oh, right? True. Especially if you make a mistake, get another piece of tubing, cut it, whatever, mm -hmm. instead of having to re-glue all kinds of different things, yeah. you know? Also a little bit more future friendly in the fact that if you need to, you can cut it apart and add another piece and mm -hmm. whatnot. So like just because the hard plumbing looks super sweet and has some other advantages, <laughs> don't forget that soft tubing actually has a place in reefing and is much, much easier to work with than hard PVC. All right, but number two, closely related to that, a lot of people make this mistake. Yeah, the mistake here is using tubing that kinks. So it's kind of a double-edged sword with that soft tubing in that if I use silicone tubing, uh, the chances of if I don't have gradual changes to you know arc and pitch, it's gonna kink. Opposite of that, if I use like braided vinyl, it's kind of fixed in that, you know, bent, you know, wrapped around the spool form factor. So I have to, you know, manipulate it a little more, use some heat or what have you, uh, but less chances of kinking. Yeah, so you absolutely should use this braided vinyl tubing because it doesn't kink anywhere near as easy. Yes, you can force it to yeah. at some point, but especially on your overflows. So if you're gonna use soft tubing on your overflows, you're gonna to wanna to use big vinyl tubing and make sure that it uh, doesn't have, not the flimsy kind that can kink, because what will happen is if it kinks, all that water's going on your floor. And you <laughs> absolutely don't want that. So uh, I know it's cheaper to use that really thin, flimsy stuff, but avoid that because it's one of the biggest mistakes you could do, especially if you uh, don't wanna replace your floors. All right, so number three. Yeah, the mistake here is not deciding whether or not your plumbing is going to be part of the display and do you want it to look as nice as the display tank. Uh, this is really where those colored PVC types of P uh, plumbing and fittings come in and uh, really taking the time to, you know, make it look eye appealing. I'd say for a lot of people, the plumbing is the display. Yeah, true. Right? Like <laughs> I want the gear to look just as nice as the display tank does mm -hmm. uh, and put just as much uh, effort into it. But actually part of it is, you know, decide whether or not anybody's ever gonna be able to see it. Yeah. So on uh, one of the ULM tanks, we did a really immaculate job, but then it went up against the wall. It was Nobody gone. even see it and it was pretty <laughs> expensive to do. Yeah. So, you know, think about it, is it, you know, something that you're gonna like actually be able to enjoy? Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, somewhat maybe peace of mind, just kind of knowing it was there and the fun project and the photos yeah. of doing it is maybe enough. But, you know, really try to make that decision before you do it. Are you the kind of person that really wants the gear to look as nice as the tank, have it look clean, uh, and make some of those decisions up front. All uh, right, so related to that is? Uh, this is missing the value of hard plumbing. So there is some distinct, you know, differences between soft and hard plumbing. And, you know, with hard plumbing, my, my fitting options and all of these different plumbing options are expanded even further. So I have unions and all of these other, you know, hard, you know, check valves. And uh, I'm just open myself up to a lot more options when plumbing my tank. Yeah, so obviously hard plumbing doesn't kink. It's been my experience that if you take your time to uh, glue it properly or, or use the solvent properly, mm. that it is way less likely to leak today as well as 10 years from now. Yeah. Uh, and I just find that it also looks a lot sharper. So, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of value in it. It's just also a lot more expensive to hard plumb your tank. Mm -hmm. You can do it with fittings, uh, like white fittings from your like Home Depot or Lowe's, which is a lot cheaper than yeah. fancy Schedule 80 and colored piping. Uh, but if you get the colored piping uh, involved, uh, <laughs> it actually looks really, really sharp. My favorite being blue and gray, yeah. but uh, red and white's pretty popular. 
But you know, really think about the different advantages of the hard plumbing. It's going to be the fittings. Mm. It's going to be the leak-free, no kinks. And you're actually going to be able to make corners and stuff that you would never be able to make mm -hmm. with uh, soft plumbing, specifically that ULM, uh, the SPS ULM. Oh, yeah. All of the corners and everything we did that would never be possible using soft plumbing. All right, number five in relation to making sure that it is leak free. Yeah, number five is not cleaning the pipe ends uh, and dealing with them. So for, I'm super guilty of this myself. I take, take a chop saw or a hacksaw, you know, cut my piping and it's got a bunch of burrs and stuff on it. It might not even be a straight 90 degree angle, uh, but then I just run with it because I'm in a hurry and I want to get this plumbing done. And, you know, with all of the burrs and stuff in there, it makes a, a point of uh, potential leaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to like slip another tip in here too. Okay. So when you're cutting soft uh, or hard plumbing, get one of those like $5 miter boxes yeah. that allows you to use a hacksaw and get a nice straight edge. Otherwise it tends to like curve, yep. right? Yep. And the curve actually makes it hard to measure, you know, when mm -hmm. you're putting it together as well. So use the miter box, but also when you're done, there'll be those little burrs and edges on there. And what those things are gonna do when you push it into the fitting, is gouge into mm. the glue and the solvent in there and create little channels. That's one of the reasons why we spin it when we're done. But if you just take that piece of sandpaper and just do a couple turns on it, you'll totally solve that problem and it is a step absolutely worth doing. All right, number six, after doing a couple large plumbing <laughs> installs of my own and ending up with leaks at the end of it, I just stopped like, you know, winging it on a lot of different things and I follow all the steps because I do not want to have to cut it apart if it leaks. I want to do it right. And so one yeah, of those things is the the missing the value here of the clear primer for, you know, plumbing. So you know, for me specifically, I went to my local hardware store. I got the, you know, the contractor's pack and I just went to town. Well, that has purple pr uh, primer in it and I'm using, you know, white fittings and everything. So I've got purple leak points and I got all this purple, you know, primer everywhere. S actually stained like my carpet and my clothes and stuff because I got it on me. Uh, but there is clear. Yeah. So the purple is designed for like home inspections to make sure that the person plumbing your house right. actually did it. Uh, but uh, we don't need that at home. Uh, and so uh, use the clear and then it will look a lot nicer, mm. but also an important part of the whole step and uh, making sure that your system ends up leak free. All right, so number seven is something a lot of you think about, but we don't always get right. Yeah, this is not making an informed decision about internal or external overflows. Uh, there's distinct differences between the two. Uh, one, I get a, you know, a low profile look inside the tank. The other, a little more obtrusive, but it kind of goes beyond that too. Yeah, so for me, the biggest question is, do I want to push the tank almost all the way up to the wall? Yep. Which in case, in that case, I'm going to have an internal overflow, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, am I willing to take the tank off of the wall, which allows me to have like the kind of ghost uh, or overflow external that comes off the back. Mm. Now I need to leave a little room for plumbing, but now I don't have that giant box in the tank. Yeah. The box in the tank will obstruct flow, especially if you take the rock work off the back. Now still there's this big box in the middle or in the corners or whatnot that's hard to get around. So there's always a give and take here. With one exception actually is a tank like behind you with these uh, like Maxes and the all-in-ones yeah. like the E170 and stuff where they actually have a combination of both yeah. where the internal or the overflow is actually along the back but it also allows you to push it all the way up to the wall for a nice clean look. Yeah. But make an informed decision on this thing because flow to me matters. Also taking up really precious real estate in the tank matters. If it's an area where I just don't mind that it's a couple inches off the wall, so be it. If it's a place where I'm constantly going to see the plumbing, nope, push it <laughs> up against the wall. So really, really think about that when you're selecting your tank and understanding the type of plumbing that you want to install on yours. So number eight, uh, this is not plumbing for two return pumps. So in the thought process of redundancy and having a backup pump should one fail, uh, this is becoming like more increasingly more and more what we aim to do. Mm -hmm. So he used the word should, when, yeah. right? Oh, uh, yeah. One, it will fail. Uh, it will get clogged with the snail. It will get clogged with calcium carbonate. It will just break the return pump, the heart, the lifeblood of your system that connects your filtration to your tank 
will stop working at some point, Yeesh. right? Yeah. And uh, it's not one of those things that will happen probably in seven years. It will almost certainly happen in the first couple uh, and definitely in the first few. So, you know, we really want to think about that. So even if today, when you're setting up your tank, you only plumb for one, put in two returns yeah. uh, our, our drill holes for the return lines in your tank, one on each side of the overflow. So at a later date, it's really easy for you to add a second one because at some point you will absolutely realize the value of having two hearts in your tank. So if one fails, the other one is always providing circulation and connecting all the tank's life support and filtration to the tank. Number nine. Uh, number nine is not considering pipe size or pipe diameter. So uh, for me, it's, uh, I've always been three quarter inch return, one inch or one and a half inch drain. Uh, but when you start to think about you know, flow and getting the maximum amount of flow through from your pump, uh, the wider the diameter, the faster the flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just always try to go with the biggest diameter that makes sense, yeah. right? Uh, and sometimes just go like one step up. You know, if you're gonna go to inch, go to inch and a quarter or whatnot. Mm -hmm. the inch and a quarter is a little harder to work with in some cases, just the availability of fittings and whatnot. Yeah. But you know what? Just always make sure that you go one step up and whatever you do, don't go step down from the actual pump because uh, it's definitely on the intake. But even on the outtake, you're just gonna reduce the total amount of flow and sometimes you can compensate actually for lots of different turns and whatever that create head pressure by just making the pipe bigger as well. All right, so number 10 is pretty closely related to that. Yeah, number 10 is the missing that Schedule 80 pipe has a smaller inside diameter. So the outside diameter, Schedule 40, Schedule 80, the same. They all fit the same parts, interchangeable with fittings, but you have a thicker wall on Schedule 80 plumbing. Yeah, so the fittings, no big deal. Yep. Uh, but the pipe actually itself, if you like gray pipe, the gray pipe, you have to accept the fact that it's built for super high pressure insulations, unlike yours, which is very low pressure yeah, right. in an aquarium. Uh, so it's thicker, and that means there's a smaller diameter hole, so a little less water. So you can totally compensate for that by going like one size up, and it will cost a little bit more for the install. But if you like that gray look, it's just part of the whole cost of the install. So number 11, almost the same thing you just shared actually. Yeah, I almost just said it. And that is that uh, not thinking that the Schedule 80 and Schedule 40 work together, because they absolutely do. Again, it's about the outer pipe diameter versus the inside diameter. So all the fittings are interchangeable. Yeah, so uh, frankly, you probably never know any of this. So, uh, cause all the fittings all fit together just yeah. fine. So you can intermix Schedule 80 with Schedule 40 and all of it will work together. The only difference again is a little bit less flow that's coming through the 80 and not the fittings, just the pipe. All right, so number 12? Uh, number 12 is not putting silicone tubing on your return pump. So DC, AC, AC in particular, but there's gonna be a small amount of vibration regardless of the pump. And you can eliminate almost all of that vibration or much of it by just putting a section of, you know, two or three inches of soft silicone tubing on the end before you go into hard tubing. Yeah, a lot of times what people will do is drill a hole into the sump and then there'll be a bulkhead in there and the bulkhead uh, will have a barb fitting that goes down to your return and it'll be hard plumbed into there. Yep. So actually uh, we were picking uh, like a couple of days ago, picking orders in the back and I was really surprised to see how many people were ordering two foot long yeah. lengths of silicone tubing because they're doing just that with it. You're eliminating the transfer of vibration from the pump to the plumbing, which really ends up being like an instrument that just kind of echoes throughout the right. house. So if you want to reduce all that vibration and you want to have the silentest uh, return possible, you're going to use a piece of silicone tubing and any old soft tubing won't do this. Uh, and they'll do it to some degree, but silicone really absorbs the vibration mm. the best. All right, so number 13, if you watch anything on plumbing, you've already heard it from me. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, the mistake here is not tripling the amount of uh, your planned union. So uh, every twist and turn, every part of this system that you wanna eventually take off or maintain or you know, have uh, the ability to adjust, add a union there. If you think four, go with eight, 10, 12. Yeah, I, it's, this is what it happens in the beginning. You don't want to spend money on the union, you know, cost 10 bucks or whatnot. Yeah. And so you just don't want to do it. And so what happens is you get three, you have like one at the connection at the top and yeah. at the pump or wherever. And then later on, you're like, damn it, I should have put more <laughs> in there, you know, cause I can't take this thing out yep. or I just can't service that thing or I can't change it to have this other thing. 
So in the end, you should have one of these like virtually everywhere in your tank. Not only just because it allows you to disconnect it and clean it if you need be or change out equipment, uh, but also installation is a million times easier. Mm. Because if you have a, a normal 90, what happens is you got about 15 seconds to get that angle perfect. Mm. If the 90 goes into a union, I can unscrew it and I can swivel it, yep. you know, so I can get it and then lock it down, right? So if I have one of these at every uh, corner, I don't know, I no longer have to get all of the angles perfect, yeah. which means the whole thing's gonna be uh, come together better. It's gonna put less stress on anywhere where I might have got it slightly off. Mm -hmm. It's just a way better thing. So. Anywhere you can put a union, put one. Uh, they do sell them at some hardware stores, uh, like in Schedule 40, so you can check those out. Yep. We have them in 80 here. Maybe we'll bring them in in 40 in the near future. But uh, yeah, really, really think about unions. Put them anywhere you can, and it's not good enough just to have them on the ball valves. You want them everywhere. All right, so number 14. Uh, this directly related, and it's not making your PVC plumbing future flexible. So, you know, case in point is these unions. And if I wanted to swap out my return pump or I have a, like for us on the 160, we have the UV sterilizer that we didn't, uh, that we want to change the plumbing of, in which case we have already have the unions on here to make it 10 times easier to make the adjustment. We've actually done it a few different times where mm -hmm. we've taken the pieces out where the unions are, yep. you know, swapped out the roller mat for the refugium. I think we've probably done it three times where we only had to change like one piece uh, because we had the connections there that allowed us to do that. Yeah. It wasn't really a big deal. So whatever you think that you are doing today and you're like, man, I really thought this out and I got it down. Three years from now, you'll have a new piece of equipment that you want to incorporate. You'll have expanded the hobby for yourself. Do yourself a favor now and not just save some money of having to redo it, but all the time and headache. So plan it future forward. And a big piece of that is having unions at almost any connection, which allows you to disassemble it and just put pieces in rather than redoing the whole thing. So number 15, uh, this is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, the, uh, the mistake here is deciding is not deciding whether or not you actually need a manifold. This was something that affected me directly when I first started my 125 gallon tank because I just it was just part of the hobby that was really cool to me. I want a manifold because I want to run. I don't want to buy multiple pumps. I want to run reactors and all of this you know types of equipment off of a manifold. So I made sure I did, and then I actually didn't use it. Yeah. So on the 160, I'm looking at right now, none of the <laughs> ports are being used. No. So there's three of them there. We had a recirculating skimmer that fed off of it. We had mm -hmm. a carbon reactor that fed off of it. We're actually just using a bag of uh, carbon in there right now. Yeah. So, uh, you know, make sure that you're actually going to use all of those things before you spend all the money, you know, setting it up. And the, one of the reasons that we don't use it actually is because we only have one return pump on yeah. the system, right? Yeah. If I had two return pumps, I'd set one of them as the primary heartbeat and the other one as the one that will do some of the circulation through the tank, but really feed all of the equipment. So if you have two return pumps, pump one of them as the manifold and the second one we're going to use to feed the whole system. All right, so number 16. Uh, this is not considering the colder push lock type fitting. So I mean, we use these for water change systems and all this other stuff, but specifically on a manifold, it makes, you know, plugging in and unplugging plumbing super easy. Yeah, so uh, you'll, on your manifold, you'll take the uh, male piece and screw it in and you now have a connection. This other part is barbed and it just snaps right on, right? Now you have, can feed your skimmer, you can feed your reactor. When it comes time to go clean out my carbon reactor, push the button, pull Simple. it off, yeah. right? So uh, in our case, what we're using is unions and you have to like screw it all on and there's ball valves and whatever on there. So you know what? This is just a way, way, way easier way to do it. So if you uh, can see already that, yeah, with my equipment, that would be really nice if I could remove it just mm -hmm. that easy, colder push locks are one of the best solutions. All right, so 17, I stole the thunder out of already just a minute ago, but... <laughs> yeah, if you're going to use a manifold, we're on that manifold topic, it's best with two pumps. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So if you're going to do it, do it with two pumps. Uh, you'll have all the benefits of it, and you don't have to worry about all the flow loss that feeds your systems and reevaluating. And you also don't have to adjust your overflow. So mm -hmm. one of the big things there is a lot of us are running Herbie or bean animal overflows. And so if the amount of water that's coming out goes into my sump or feeding on the skimmer or whatnot changes, 
Then I also have to go adjust the amount coming down the overflow. Yep. You just don't want to really do that as much. So it's just a lot easier to have them run independently where it doesn't make as big of a difference. All right, so 18, decide this up front, please. Yeah, this, uh, the mistake here is not considering whether or not you're gonna use UV up front. So, you know, thinking future forward, plumbing my tank now, uh, if I think that I might wanna use a UV later down the road or I'm going to implement a UV now, uh, plan the plumbing for it. Yeah, if you've been watching anything that we've done on UV, the one thing that should definitely come across is if you install the wrong size one or install it wrong, it's garbage. It won't work <laughs> at all. And I shouldn't say at all, but it is really not the same value as installed correctly. Yeah. So one of the best ways is definitely to plumb it off of the return and it creates a closed kind of loop on your whole tank. Uh, a lot of times if you do it afterward, you'll try to pull from one area of the sump and you know, pour it into the other, which creates a bypass to a lot of the filtration mm. and just not the best way to do it. So really think about this one up front. Do I or do I not want to run UV? If you do, do it from the beginning. All right, so number 19. Yeah, this is having too small of a sum for your system and especially when it's related to like a power outage or the power failure. So we all know that when the system's running, there's you know some part of the water that's going to uh, end up in the sump when the power goes off, even more so if you don't have like check valves and things like that. Uh, so the, the trick here is to make sure that you have a sump big enough to handle the excess water from the display should the pump go down. Yeah, so this is even just maintenance. Yeah. Right? I'm gonna turn off the water, I don't want it to overflow. And I also don't want it to like go so close that it's like bowing yeah. and whatnot either. So really think about like uh, when you install it, making sure the return lines are high enough that minimal water drains back into the sump. Mm -hmm. But what does, the whole sump can handle because you don't want to rely on check valves because eventually those guys will fail. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of anything will you know break the seal, allow it to leak down. So make sure that your sump can handle the total amount of water during any type of power outage, including just maintenance. All right, so number. Number 20, it's time. <laughs> this, uh, the mistake here is not letting the Durso overflow die. So yep. uh, this is that, you know, one, you know, the siphon the overflow pipe and the one return. You see it a lot in reef ready tanks. I've dealt with it so much. And this is, a, you know, you drill the top of your Durso and find a way to like tune the air and, you know, tune the gate valve so you can quiet this thing down. I've had such a hard time with this thing so many times that I'm just ready to give it up. Yeah, let's take it out back and shoot it, <laughs> all right? It's done. Uh, the, the, yeah. the need to control the amount of air that's going down there so it doesn't create a siphon and gurgle, yeah. it's always gonna make noise. There's just no reason for this anymore. So let's not use a Durso anymore. We should always be looking at either the bean animal mm. or the Herbie style overflows. They're super, super silent. If you have your tank in a living space, silent is a pretty obvious desire. All right, so 21 is the inverse of that. Yeah, the, the mistake here is not going with the Herbie or Bean Animal style of uh, overflow. I mean, with, especially with these, you know, these external overflow boxes, they make it so easy to kind of to do this. So mm -hmm. uh, like the, the shadow overflows and these other ones that have three drain lines, a primary, a secondary, and an emergency, uh, it just builds in multiple layers of redundancy and I don't have to worry about my tank overflowing and my overflow overflowing, and I can in tunability 10 times easier. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, a Herbie is basically two overflows. One of them, you put a vowel valve and you tune it so that it creates a full siphon and you never hear any of the air, the mm. gurgling or not. But because a snail could crawl down there and clog it now, we have an emergency overflow over yep. here. The bean animal takes it one step further and has a second emergency. But what it kind of also allows you to do yeah. is tune this so just a little bit of the water goes down the first emergency and just makes it really, really easy to tune. Uh, and so a preference for me is definitely to go the bean animal route, but either one of these is just way, way, way better than a Durso. All right, number 22. You may do this up front, but I guarantee you'll regret it. Uh, I'm guilty of this one, and that's using crappy bulb valves. So, example right here, it's the standard hardware store ones that are just so difficult to turn. And that means, you know, you, for me, it was putting pressure on my, on my system. So uh, I got, I've outfitted it with all of these. A lot of the times they don't have the nice unions attached to them, so you'd have to put your own unions on there. But when it comes to like cranking those things and turning them, uh, I either 
push too hard and I go too far, especially if it's for fine tuning. Uh, but even then, I'm twisting and torquing all of my plumbing, especially if it's tied directly to a bulkhead. Yeah, so you may go to the store and say, wow, that thing is actually like uh, three times less expensive. <laughs> it is. Uh, and you may say, oh, I could turn it today, I guess, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the problem isn't today, the problem is a, a year from now. And I've actually did this on a really large like uh, propagation system to try to save some money. Mm. And I actually went and used a breaker bar to try to open one up after a year, and I broke the cap right off, <laughs> right? So they just get stuck and yeah. jam. They're not designed for a system full of seawater mm. and all the garbage and precipitation that goes in there. This is designed for like, you know, tap water and plumbing, normal insulation. And it, even then they kind of suck. Yeah. I actually have a, a guy who has a, like a seven thousand gallon aquarium and they the service company installed all of this type of fitting and they recently had to tear out and unplumb the whole thing because they couldn't turn a single one of the valves wow. so don't let that be you uh, go ahead and install them later or earlier on get a valve that actually just turns super easy right from the beginning these uh, CPEX valve valves are what we've been using for years they have some other advantages like when they do the seals like eventually go on these things mm -hmm. you can actually put a key in there and just tighten the seal a little bit they also come with uh, threaded fittings as well as a slip fitting right in the box so you can actually switch you know, switch them back and forth they're just a way better valve and when you go to turn it in two years from now and you go ah oh, <laughs> you'll say i made the right decision all right so number 23 what is this thing yeah the uh, <laughs> mistake here is not considering the direction of the cpex uh key the the ball valve key so mm -hmm. there is a way it may seem like there isn't uh you know a direction that you can put it anywhere there it's, it is marked with flow, but for a very specific reason. Yeah, actually, there's a little arrow right here. It says flow, yeah. right? And uh, the big thing here isn't it is that water is not going to flow through it one way or the other because it will. But because it has this feature in it, uh, you may want to think about what would happen if I wanted to go tighten down the seal on the valve, right? And it's five years from now, and I want to tighten it up. Which side is the water on when I turn everything off and I close this so it's not just pouring water out of me? Right. And if your case it actually matters, then you want to make sure that this side is actually the part that would be dry and drain into the tank so that you can put your key in there and tighten it so that the water's all trapped on this side over yeah. here. So sometimes you may want to make sure that you install that and that's why it says a flow on the side of it is to make sure that you know how to use the key and keep the water on the right side of the valve. All right, so number 24, uh, I change my mind on this one all the time. Okay, so the mistake here is not using check valves wisely. And there's a variety, a small handful of, you know, different check valves out there. And they all have a, they kind of have a different way of stopping the water when, it, when the water turns off, back pressure. One is like a flap, and the other one has like a, a little plunger, the y, the y check valve has a little plunger type thing in there that'll fall into place. So. Uh, do, does one wear out more than the other and, you know, is one safer than the other? So the big question really is though, like, you know, do I need it? Yep, true. You know, like, yeah. cause it's not, uh, we can say for sure that it's going to fail you. Mm. Like it's going to get little bits of stuff in it and Always. not work properly. Yep. How uh, long it takes for that to happen is a different question. So the big thing here is never use a check valve in anywhere where you like absolutely need to work rethink why you actually need that thing to work to begin with yeah. and solve that problem. But it doesn't mean that you can't install them, you know, for convenience factor. Like I want the water from my uh, return lines to stop going down uh, when I do maintenance and turn off the pump. Right. Like if for whatever reason it had a slow leak in that case, I don't care. Yeah. Right. It isn't a big deal. So I'm just not doing it to like, you know, prevent my sump from overflowing. That isn't the reason to do that. But for maintenance and stuff, that's an absolutely good reason. I just don't want all my corals like, you know, sitting out of the water for, you know, um, a long period of time. Right. Or I don't want them so close to the lights that the lights are burning them and stuff because there's no water on there. And so really think about how you're going to use it. As to which one, you know, there's the like George Fisher Y ones. Yep. I've always liked those because you can pull the little plunger out and clean, clean it, it really yeah. easy, right? Yeah, exactly. I uh, put a couple of unions on both sides of it. I can take it out, take it to the sink, clean it. The whole thing is good, right? Yeah. Reuse it, reinstall it. And there's a very good reason. However, it's been my experience that they do need maintenance uh, a little bit more than I would like. Yeah. Right? And so by more maintenance than you like, 
I still feel like it's like once a year and maybe once every six months, but it's the kind of thing you kind of forget about, especially if you can't access. Mm -hmm. So this guy right here is a little flopper, right? And the little flopper comes down and stops the water. It is not really cleanable. There's a little disc in there that you can't really reach to clean. However, yes, I might can start consider using these guys in the future for one reason. And that reason is I will just take it out once a year and throw it away and replace it. And it's been my experience that <laughs> these guys haven't really changed their molds in like since I started reefing. So I can just buy a new one when I need it and swap it back in rather than constantly cleaning the Y valves. And these are probably a third of the cost. Yes. So it allows yeah. you to do that more cost effectively as needed. The Ys are better, they're cleaner, but this one is maybe just replaceable. All right, number 25, uh, I've been impatient before more than once. Yeah, the mistake here is not waiting for 24 hours or more before running water through your system. So you just finished plumbing and it's the middle of the night, I'm talking about myself here, and so you're getting into one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning and I'm super excited about this thing. And uh, I just go ahead and start putting water in there after I just freshly glued all of my pieces and parts together. I mean, I've done some plumbing before, so I know that they're, they're leak free to a pretty, a pretty you know, confident degree, but you know, it's the residual type chemicals and stuff that I'm worried about. Yeah, so I don't know, man, like there's just no reason. Wait a day. <laughs> right. Okay. So like, yes, we've all done it and right. it's been fine. Maybe it's leaks, maybe it doesn't, yeah. but like, that's not really the point. Like just wait a day, like the can says, and you'll be just fine. Uh, here's the thing too, is you're spending all this time. Like, I don't know, is there like, is it reef safe in my hand? Is there yeah. uh, this chemical, that chemical, that plastic, that thing, whatever thing is right. Reef safe, reef safe, reef safe. You know what isn't reef safe? PVC glue and <laughs> yeah, primer, for sure, for sure, right? I would never pour that in my tank. So why do I want to start a brand new tank, potentially contaminating it with chemicals like that, that clearly say on the outside, don't breathe causes cancer, <laughs> right? So like uh, under no circumstances, just wait, just yeah. wait. Wait the 24 hours and you will be safer for your tank and safer for the plumbing and make sure it's leak free. So number 26 is uh, get animal protection for your uh, plumbing and leaks. Yeah, this is uh, not getting a watchdog for your system. So watchdog in the mechanical and audible alarm from battery operated system. I mean, think about this. I just did all my plumbing. How many times do I check back behind there over the years just to kind of see if there's, you know, salt creep leaks or what have you. I may have a leak that's been going on forever since I first started and pushed my tank up against the wall and have no idea that it's ruining my floors. Enter the watchdog. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little alarm that senses water and has an ear piercing noise that goes off if it ever does, yeah. right? So Super it's cheap. like uh, 12 bucks yeah. and you can set it anywhere in your sump area. And now the moment that a leak develops, even a super slow one in a hard area to see, like Randy said, all of a sudden an auto alarm goes off and you can do something about it. The best 12 bucks you could probably spend. Number 27, gosh, man, I've done these all, uh, <laughs> is? Uh, the mistake here is being afraid of drilling your own tank. So I've seen, um, you know, a lot of posts, myself included, had to take a tank of mine over to a buddy's house because I just wasn't comfortable drilling it myself. But then I, you know, I'm thinking back to it, uh, how many tanks and even just like five gallon, you know, 10 gallon tanks I've seen on like Craigslist or Facebook marketplace, all these different places where if I was really afraid about it, just grab some like dollar free tanks sometimes and practice. Don't even need to do that. Uh, I gotta tell you, I drilled, uh, I, I bought a 110 gallon tank that needed to be drilled. You know, got buddies to load it into a car, drove it all the way down to the fish store, you know, left it there for a week, then redid the process afterward, you know, yeah. paid a whole bunch of money for it. Mm. And then later on in life, I drilled my first one. And I'm like, <laughs> I like, what did I do that for? Yeah. That was so much rigmarole. Now I've done so many, I think I could do it blindfolded. <laughs> it's so easy. Yeah. So there's tons of videos on it. Anybody could do this. There's like, it's really hard to even mess up. Uh, just make sure that it isn't tempered glass and you can find that on almost anywhere too. Yep. Uh, but if you need to put a hole in your tank, 
you know, this is a hobby. You should just watch a little bit of information on how to do it. It's super easy. So uh, I would encourage you. It's also a really, really fun project. Yep. So do it with someone fun and uh, crack a beer maybe afterward and uh, feel like an accomplishment. All right, so 28. This happens to me. And it is assuming that threaded fittings make it easy to take apart. It absolutely does not. Yeah. Okay. First off, the threaded fittings are way more likely to uh, leak yep. than the uh, like uh, solvent fittings, you know, or slip fittings. And the thought process is often that if I can screw it in, then later on I can screw it out. Except for usually, it's actually glued to something that doesn't screw. Uh, <laughs> True. Uh, and so even with uh, you put it on a, a bulkhead, and like and now I can unscrew the bulkhead, I guess. But like, how do I actually even get this out, this mm. nipple out of here, without damaging it with the pliers or whatnot? So I'll just say it, like, uh, unless you absolutely need to, threaded fittings are actually way harder to deal with. They are way more likely to have uh, leaks, not just today, but also over time. Mm -hmm. And really don't make it that much easier to disassemble in most cases. There are a few cases where that's the case, but make sure that you're really thinking about it before you're relying on threaded fittings to make anything easier. All right, so number 29, I answer this on hashtag AskBeersTV like maybe once a week. Okay, <laughs> the mistake here is thinking that the threads on the outside of the bulkhead are for plumbing. I made this mistake the very first tank I ever plumbed. I tried to find a fitting that would go over. I went, I took my bulkhead to the hardware store and the only fitting that I could find that felt like it went on right, but it absolutely wasn't, was like a galvanized elbow and I used it and it leaked everywhere. But the thing is, is it's only here for the retaining nut. That's it. Yeah, so I did the same thing on that 110 I was talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah. I went and bought a uh, 90 with a female thread on it and thought I could screw it on there. And first I'm like, well, why doesn't this one inch thing work with this one inch? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Well, well uh, clearly it's bigger for some reason. So I went and got the one and a half inch. Yep. And you know what? It kind of went yep, on, yep. but kind of with threads means garbage, right? <laughs> and I was stupid enough to put like enough tape on it that it finally did like leak and again, or not leak, but on uh, an overflow, there isn't like a high pressure. And that was the case that I was using it on. Yeah. Still not a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. So use the proper fitting that goes on the inside. The outside of this is just for this nut and it does not have the same pipe fitting uh, or thread size as any of the other fittings. Just don't use it for that purpose. So if there's only one thing you heard today, let it be this. For me personally, is don't listen to everybody out there on the internet just tells you you can glue it together, add some PVC glue into your tank or whatever. <laughs> like, just don't do all that stuff. It's possible, but really let's do some best practices here because all this stuff is super expensive. It's a lot of work to do. And just a little bit of extra effort on the front can make sure you get it right the first time and you're not one of those people afterwards saying, damn it, I should have listened, <laughs> right? So, you know, make sure that you cut it square, use that little $5 miter box, use a little piece of sand per paper to get the burrs off, yeah. use the primer, use the solvent properly, and make sure you get it right. Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. For me, it's that waiting and taking your time. I'm not, I'm, I'm an impatient person, so I wanna chop, glue, put together, add water, and it's led me down the wrong path multiple times because I rushed it. I think going forward, I will deliberately take multiple days to do my own plumbing. Yeah, okay. So if you wanna learn more about plumbing, I think we actually have like two more of these. Like we yeah. could actually do, there's so many things to learn about plumbing, uh, but we do have a playlist that is building. We've got uh, probably dozens of videos already in it. And yep. Just more come out all the time. So if you wanna go see everything we know about plumbing, check out this playlist.